I'm a teacher, I'm a writer, this is my standard uh, self-presentation, but uh, above all, for the, since at least the 1970s, I've been uh, working as a feminist and activist, and um, uh, I've been writing on women's theory, women's history, and uh, I've also been involved in many other um, political movements, for example, the anti-globalization movement, uh, the movement around education, particularly around student struggles, students and teacher struggles, the anti death penalty movement. So for, and um, you know, presently I'm very, very interested in uh, the Occupy movement and the movement around the commons. I know you were involved also in, in, in the women's movement, the labor movement in, in, in Italy. So how was your relation to the movement in Italy? Actually, my relationship to the women's movement in Italy was that through the Wages for Housework Network, the International Wages for Housework campaign that came into existence in 1972. In uh, the summer of 1972, a number of women met in Padova from different countries. And uh, that was the beginning of the launching of the campaign for wages for housework and so my relationship to women in Italy was through this network although it has continued long beyond uh, the, the end of the network itself and I still have you know, many contacts. So, so when the book, the book came out much later, right? the cover yeah. in the witch book, but so how is this like your early development and this involvement in these movements linked to the book? How, when did you get this idea to do this research? Yeah, I began actually in the mid 70s and as I wrote in the preface to Caliban and the Witch, in fact, I began after beginning to, I, want, I was very interested in looking at the history of uh, you know, the women's oppression, what used to be called women's oppression and seeing um, how it had changed in capitalism uh, in response to many of the debates that were taking place in the women's movement as to whether the uh, gender-based discrimination was a legacy of tradition, uh, was a remnant of previous patriarchal relation, uh, or it was a specific type of uh, social reality specific to capitalism. So that's how I began this historical work that started with the 19th century and then, uh, for lack of good answers, took me back to the Middle Ages. And then, after a while, I began to collaborate with uh, Leopoldo Fortunati, as I spoke, as I wrote in the preface to Caliban and the Witch. Uh, we had an early version of this work, but actually quite different. Um, in, in Italian, they came out in 1984 but where I began to sketch the discussion of the witch hunt and the discussion of the transformation of the body in capitalism. But we also discussed other issues such as, for example, the transformation that uh, child raising uh, undergoes in, uh, the, in um, the beginning of capitalist development. So um, this is a work that has accompanied me for decades. And uh, by 2004, I had been with it almost 30 years. There's a book that you published in '84 in Italy. Mm -hmm. what, 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 like, how did you, how did you do the research? Uh, was it with Fortunati and others? Yeah, or, uh, we actually worked quite separately because uh, I was in New York and she was in Padova, so we actually did work in a separate way. And um, you know, even even though we kind of exchanged some basic informations. But uh, so that work uh, was supposed to basically concentrate on looking at different aspects of the reorganization of reproduction. For example, it has a chapter on the transformation of sociality, of forms of sociality. Uh, it has a chapter on uh, precisely the redefinition of the figure of the child. Uh, it has a chapter specifically on the question of sexuality. Um, and but the, the the frame the framework of that book was somewhat different in a way it was before the beginning of globalization and uh, the idea there was in a way to show that the classic uh, uh, operaist uh, one of the ideas but that not only the classic marxist approach to primitive accumulation 
but also the opera is the approach to class struggle and to um, basically capitalist development were, were unsatisfactory. Uh, and one of the themes in the introduction was first comes society in quote, meaning first comes the reproduction of labor power and then comes the factory, which turned the other way around. For example, the Trontian idea that the factory is the prime mover and in a sense the factory then also changes society. And uh, we, you know, our, our argument was that when you look actually at the history of capitalism, you see that capitalism first had to form a certain type of laborer and only in a later period, in a sense, uh, creates, you know, on, on, uh, on, the, on the basis of the formation of that type of labor also creates a certain type of organization of work. Mm -hmm. Particularly, uh, the, 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 a large-scale industrial uh, organization of industrial work. Yeah. Be between, before we come to the to the Caliban and the Witch book, bef be after publishing the Italian version, or you know, um, and before you, this is twenty years, right? Before you published the the book, uh, Caliban and the Witch. How did that discussion continue? Did you collaborate with others apart from? No, Fulton? no. Actually, that discussion pretty much continued. I continued the work pretty much by myself. But one major trans uh, development that took place was the fact that uh, by the early eighties, uh, I went to Africa. I was in Africa for about three years, and that experience was fundamental because in Africa I saw really the beginning of globalization. I saw uh, what were the first element of a return of primitive accumulation, you know, through the imposition of structural adjustment and all the policies that were put enact, enacted in response to the debt crisis. So in, in a way, the, the, uh, again, as I wrote in the introduction to Caliban and the Witch, I was continuously brought back to the period of primitive accumulation, but what was unfolding, you know, under my eyes, including uh, the fact that uh, the discussion about the debt crisis, uh, the conditionalities posed by the IMF, and uh, the, the discussion of austerity came hand in hand with uh, a whole ideological attack on women, which in many ways were accused of having caused and you know the crisis with their excessive demand and uh, with their pressure on uh, you know the, 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 the workers the, the family member etc etc for the better living conditions so the the, the the striking similarity between the processes that i saw unfolding in the 80s in nigeria and uh, what i had been reading uh, concerning the period of primitive accumulation was uh, very important for my own rethinking and uh, my own placing that discussion also in a broader framework. Mm -hmm. So, so let's talk about the book. Like how uh, you know the the book is, is um, divided in several chapters. Could you describe like the you know the, mm -hmm. the contents and the main argument? Yeah, basically the book is, the, uh, is made of a number of chapters. The first one, it's a chapter about uh, the crisis of feudalism. And in particular, it's a chapter that uh, looks at the reasons why uh, capitalism developed. You know, and uh, which was fundamental, in my view, in order to understand uh, what would be the modalities of uh, the new structures and the, and the new structures that capitalism had to implement. Uh, so I, in particular, was concerned with um, demystifying, uh, you know, uh, rejecting the assumption that uh, capitalism was a kind of evolution out of economic structures that had developed in the Middle Ages, and to show, in fact, that capitalism was a counter-revolution. The capitalism was the response to a whole uh, set of social movements, a struggle. That was very important to me because it, uh, it uh, connected, uh, it really gave me an, an insight you know, to, um, into the struggle that women had been making uh, in the course of the struggle against feudal power. 
and uh, therefore an insight as to why the attack, why capitalism in a way, the development of capitalism had to start with this massive attack on women. Uh, and uh, this was for me one of the most uh, exciting and satisfying uh, um, researches, you know, uh, this, because it, it brought me in contact with the whole set of social movement that I knew vaguely of, like the erratic movement uh, from my early studies of uh, European history, but I had no idea how important those movements had been because the erratic movement were really movement of social struggle. They were movement against uh, basically feudal power, but also the beginning of commercialization and uh, of social relations. And, um, and I began to see also the role of women within this erratic movement, which was very uh, strong. Women had a central presence in those movements. So this was important because, first of all, um, allow me to see two things in terms of uh, uh, in terms of understanding capitalism. It allowed me to see, number one, that capitalism had come in response to a struggle, and in particular in response to the labor crisis, to the command of a labor, the crisis of command of a labor that this movement had produced. Uh, and therefore, like, not accidentally, capitalism was uh, vitally interested uh, in uh, creating relations uh, that would uh, maximize the exploitation of labor. And second, that within this struggle, and that uh, women have played an important role, and the refusal of certain relations with men, and also a particular relation to procreation, uh, have been important, have played an important role in, the, in this struggle. For example, the diuretic movement uh, gave women a certain status of parity with men and uh, also a movement that uh, was um, uh, <coughs> critical with, with respect to um, women's subordination, but also the exclusion of women from uh, the position of some power, for example, uh, in, in the organization and administration of sacraments and so forth. Uh, so that too was important because it opened the it opened the possibility of understanding why this specific attack on women. So that that is basically the first chapter, right? Of the of yeah. The book. Oh, the first chapter, yes. And uh, the the second chapter, uh, it's um, it's a broad broad analysis of the main processes uh, that constituted the transition to capitalism. In other words, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a chapter that in a way uh, tries to uh, rethink the process of accumulation that Marx writes about at the end of uh, Capital Volume 1, but rethinking from a different point of view. In fact, writing that history that Marx does not write, which is the history of primitive accumulation, you know, from the point of view of uh, the reproduction, the transformation in the reproduction of labor power, and uh, <clears throat> and also the transformation in the position of women, and so it looks at all set of processes that, um, for instance, it goes back, it re-examines uh, the enclosures, the separation of workers from the land. Right? but also uh, examines not only the separation of workers from the land, but one of the uh, key points in that analysis is that that's only the beginning you know, of, of uh, the, the development of capitalism. The equal important was the separation of production and reproduction. In fact, this is one of the main theme of that second chapter, that what we have at the beginning of capitalism. In other words, capitalism begins uh, not only with the divorcing of the peasantry from the land, which also takes place, by the way, in the, in the New World, uh, um, but uh, begins with a, a separation, not physical, but in terms of social relation, of production from reproduction, that 
from an early stage, 16th, 17th century, you begin to see that there's a whole set of activities that begin to not appear any longer as economic activities. And in fact, and these are reproductive activities, and that these same activities are also now more and more naturalized uh, and genderized and identified as women's work. Uh, so this is the, 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 the center of this chapter, to, to show that um, when we speak of the precondition for the development of capitalism, we have to speak of a process that is much wider than Marx assumed. Mm -hmm and that uh, includes also the formation of a whole sphere of activity that is structurally devalued. And in fact, that devaluation is so structural that throughout all its transformation, capitalism has always uh, reproduced that devaluation down to our day, which I think globalization, in fact, to the extent that globalization is a return of primitive accumulation, uh, at the center of it, you have that devaluation of reproductive activities. Um, and uh, then we have the, fourth, the third chapter. It's a chapter about the body that looks at the, what happens to the body uh, in the uh, reorganization, capitalist organization of production and work. And the, the reason for the chapter is partially, again, to continue that history that Marx does not write. Uh, but partially is because to, to highlight the fact that um, you know, capitalism is a, the, has a very unique system, uh, different, specific with respect to other forms of exploitation in that it sees you know, labor as the fundamental form of wealth, uh, which is uh, very important in terms of the type of disciplinary regime that it has to implement. So that the moment in which you see the labor is the fundamental forms of wealth, then, uh, then there's a whole policy towards the body that has to be put into place, because then the body is this great a field of resources that have to be maximized, they have to be developed. Uh, but of course, uh, there is a dialectic of development and repression, and I'm very critical here of Foucault. Foucault always stresses the moment of development, that uh, new productive capacities are developing, that we cannot write a history only from the point of view of repression. Very true. but. Repression is the first moment. You cannot have the development of new capacity in the body without the destruction of a whole set of forms of behavior, practices, beliefs that uh, had been fundamental uh, in the culture of pre-capitalist society, including um, medieval society in Europe. Uh, so the, the uh, third chapter basically is a description of the different strategies that through the laws, through the transformation of the organization of everyday life, capitalism puts into place. And simultaneously, also, it is a description of how uh, these transformation are then reflected in a mediated way in, in uh, the discursive disciplinary field, the disciplinary field in terms of the disciplines. In other words, in the intellectual, philosophical, uh, discussion of the time, for example, in the works of Descartes, in the works of Hobbes. So, for instance, it interprets uh, in, 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 in terms of Cartesianism, the rise of Cartesianism, you know, as, as a particular response to, to the class struggle, right? And as a, a response to the needs of the new discipline of work. You know, they demand a process of self exploitation self-management, and so forth. Then uh, there is the fourth chapter on the witch hunts, and uh, that is a long analysis of um, the witch hunts, how they took place, you know, what the witch hunt was in essence, uh, with, uh, in uh, different countries, you know, with all due varieties depending on the particular countries. Uh, and then fundamentally, it's an attempt to, to explain how the witch hunts relates to the broader attack on the proletariat uh, 
and the broader process of primitive accumulation that was taking place in this period. And it looks at the different ways in which, uh, in which the Vichan connects to these developments uh, by looking at who were the witches from the point of view of their social status and what were the crimes they were uh, accused of and basically shows that there is a direct connection between uh, the witchcraft charges and uh, the process of land enclosure. Uh, there is also a relationship between witchcraft charges and trials and uh, the uh, attack and uh, um, redefinition of women's sexuality, which is basically, uh, in a sense, uh, discipline to, towards uh, its reproductive role, because one of the key tasks in this moment in for capitalism is also to take uh, control over women's reproductive capacities, so that the control of women's bodies, women's reproduction, biological reproduction and women's sexuality are extremely important, both in terms of the new discipline of labor, but also in terms of actually using the female body as an instrument for the production of the working class the biological the creation of a new generation of workers. And uh, it shows, in fact, of how um, the witch hunt was functional to these, uh, to these goals. Um, and here again, there is a polemic, if you want, uh, uh, with Marx and with, and with Foucault, uh, both of whom do not recognize the importance of uh, this uh, Im immensely the importance of, of, of this event, which I see as uh, fundamental to the formation of modern capitalist society. I mean, it's one of the great massacres that inaugurates, you know, the, the advent of modern capitalism. You have uh, the slave trade, you have the conquest of the Americas, uh, you have the, the persecution of the witches. Uh, so that, that is um, the, the also, um, in, in uh, the last chapter, in a, in a way, um, the last chapter takes you know, some of the analysis of the first four uh, to the New World. And in fact, it shows that uh, the persecution of witches is not purely European phenomena, but actually starting from the last part of the 16th century is uh, exported. Uh, to the so-called New World, and that in fact you have execution of um, witchcraft is broadly used by missionary and conquistadores, you know, both as, as, a, as, a, as a means of conquest, as a means of breaking down resistances, and specifically also to implement a new division of labor between women and men uh, in, in um, uh, the New World as well and he looks at it particularly with reference to the Andes and uh, with reference also to the struggle the women in the Andes uh, already in the 16th century uh, mount against colonization and against the dominance of the priest, against the dominance of the new religion. Wow. Mm. Well, it's good that you already mentioned this, you know, your critique of Marx and, and Foucault um, but but let's 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 start earlier. Um, you you mentioned this separation between productive and reproductive mm -hmm. in in the, in the well actually in the early stages of making capitalism right. What what was the force like? How was it enforced this separation? The separation between production and reproduction. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was enforced in many ways. But uh, one of the things, for instance, that you begin to notice in the 16th century in many parts of Europe is the exclusion of women from, uh, from the guilds, which had been the organization of workers. And uh, the fact that, in, in fact, uh, in Germany, in a number of towns, uh, you even have uh, a municipal prescription that argue that women should not engage in wage labor. And uh, we have uh, uh, documents uh, showing the women had to appeal, for example, to the, the local municipalities to be allowed to do work for the wage, often on the argument that they were widows and they did not have other means of support. So you find that within a course of a century, uh, the only jobs that actually women could do were the productive jobs. 
particularly as handmaids and uh, you know as domestic workers or nurses you know be, being a wet nurse was a very very common uh, job for peasant women you know but increasingly or washer women uh, so that uh, the, the, the new forms of wage labor, the forms of wage labor that, that from which women actually were excluded until the last part of the 18th century, you know, when, when uh, then women are, you know, inserted into uh, industrialization. They become the, the labor force for the new factories. And uh, together with that, you have a massive, massive expansion of prostitution. Uh, I speak in the book about the fact that uh, all of a sudden prostitution becomes a mass phenomenon and interesting enough, of course, it is also begins to be criminalized, which it was not uh, in the Middle Ages. Mm. You, you mentioned this, they were excluded from the guilds and later you, you also talk about the role of the state right, in this process of but, sort of creating a that, well, actually, two parts of a new class, right? Can you elaborate this? this what was the state role? Well, this, the, state, the state role uh, in, in uh, well, first of all, I mean, the state plays an extremely important uh, part in this period in, in the creation of a whole structure that supports the new division of labor, the new sexual division of labor. So I already mentioned regulation concerning work and regulation concerning sexuality uh, that, uh, for example, the criminalization of prostitution, right? But you also have a whole new set of regulation that uh, begin to penalize in a very, very heavy way, unprecedented, for example, uh, attempts the women would do to control their reproductive capacity. So that uh, there is, for instance, a whole new policing of the process of procreation that uh, has a tremendous impact on the life of women. And uh, any infraction to that policy is, begins to be criminalized and penalized with death. So that, for instance, uh, infanticide, Right now, the, the, the charge of infanticides you know, leads many, many women, has almost as many women uh, to be persecuted and executed as, for, uh, you know, as, as, as they were for witchcraft. Infanticide in the 16th, 17th century uh, begins the second largest penalty, the largest crime for which women were penalized. Um, so, and of course, most important of all, the state uh, is uh, the place from which all the legislations against witches were emanated. Uh, unlike the witch hunts that are taking place today, uh, that with which I will speak later, uh, it is the state. You know, the witch hunt, and it, it's, it's a, a mass persecution that took place by totally legal means totally legal means. It was uh, uh, launched in most countries by state legislation. It's the state that promulgates a new legislation that says they are witches, we have to persecute them, the population has to assist us in this, in this task. And, uh, and these ordinances are then read in the churches, are then propagated throughout the villages and the towns, and then everybody is asked basically to take a position on one side or the other. And if you do not collaborate, of course, you are in danger of being accused as a witch. So the state has a central role uh, in the formation of the, new, um, of the new sexual division of labor and also the new gender roles. Mm. One, one thing I just want to clarify, because I think most people are not familiar with this argument at all. You describe um, capitalism as a result, or capital itself as a counter-revolution against, mm -hmm. you could say, anti-feudal yeah. resistance. Right. I mean, right. And there's a there's a this very complex. You know, yeah. So could you just describe like your view on what why counter-revolution against whom and and yeah. and why you know the other picture would be capitalism as an anti-feudal 
Yeah. Re like yeah. reaction, you know, but you have a different view. Yeah, just... no, I have a very different view. Yeah. I, in a way, I read uh, capitalism not just as, uh, you know, there, there is a liberal view that the capitalist, in a way, the figure of the capitalist is a development over the figure of the merchant. That at a certain point towards the 13th, 14th century, uh, with the uh, revitalization of commerce, you know, after the, 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 the big breakdown due to the, quote, barbaric invasions, when commerce starts again in the urban centers of the Middle Ages, right, we begin to see uh, forms of proto-capitalism, uh, and from that figure, or some, some people even argue on the basis of long-term, long-distance trade, right, long-distance trade, to procure luxuries for the nobility, uh, that's capitalism develops out of the ground. I don't read it that way, because when you see the kind of policy and the kinds of developments the capitalism puts into place, uh, and you see it not, not uh, in one area only, but you see it on, on a more global scale, uh, you realize that in fact the main preoccupation that uh, the proto-capitalist class had was to regain control over work. And that, in fact, what brought about the crisis of capitalism, in other words, capitalism comes out of a crisis, comes out, uh, it's clearly uh, the response to, to the crisis of all sector structure, to the fact that you have an aristocratic class, but also a merchant class not only aristocratic class, but the famous merchant class from which capitalism was supposed to have developed, that are in crisis by the 14th century. And they are in crisis after the weight of labor struggles. Uh, and a capitalism responds directly to those labor struggles. And there is, um, well, the best evidence that I bring to it, and it's not my discovery, it's the, the intensity of, of struggle in the, in the urban and rural areas in this period, right? That, that uh, for example, peasant wars that sweep through, through Europe, uh, in Spain, in France, Germany, uh, England, uh, and also the struggle of artisans. So you see a structure that cannot reproduce itself and when you see the response, for example, the, res the response that it takes, conquest, that ca in a sense you have, you have uh, um, the capitalist is not a new class, it's a new class from the point of view of social relation. But it's basically the feudal lord in England who recycles himself, right? It's the merchant and who basically, it's the clergy who basically launch uh, a whole set of parallel but combined uh, developments. The conquest, so externalizing, you know, responding to the crisis by basically acquiring new assets, you know, acquiring new labor through, through external conquest, and that's where, you know, and then the Americas provide the bullion that creates uh, a market economy in Europe. It's the silver that comes from the new world that creates a market economy. So. It's very clear that, that uh, it, can, it does not come out of an evolutionary process. That the forces that led to capitalism were not present in Europe. That actually what was present in Europe was the crisis of a system that could not reproduce itself, was the crisis of a ruling class that could not reproduce itself. And that in fact that ruling class had to transmogrify itself and had to, in a sense, go outside of his borders, you know, to procure the, 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 the assets, to procure the labor, to procure the, the wealth that would enable it to relaunch itself in a new way. And it's in the process. I, I like to say that capitalism, when it, it begins to be formed as a system, is, uh, it, it, it forms as a system as the result of, of many of, of many, um, you know, developments, of, of many initiatives, which begins to take a particular configuration. 
that begins to be coordinated and take a particular configuration by the end of the 16th century. It's already very visible in the form of a new global economy, the beginning of a global economy. Mm, one, one thing you've already you know, addressed, but, uh, but just to have it like, as a clear point, is your critique of uh, the concept of primitive accumulation in Marx, right? which actually in the process which you just described, that's the next process, right, in, right. historically. Right. So, um, so you mentioned the enclosures, Marx also, you know, draws on this. So could you describe like, you know, sort of using Marx's mm -hmm. concept and then your critique yeah. of that concept? Yeah, so. but for Marx's primitive accumulation, there are two things that are problematic in Marx in primitive accumulation. First of all, because he only sees uh, as crucial, as foundational of the new capitalist system, right, this process of separation, of the worker from the means of production, the, 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 the expulsion of the peasantry and so forth. And uh, that's very important, but it's not sufficient. And even uh, adding to it the, the, the attack, the bloody legislation against the vagabond, that's very important, but it's, but it's not enough. And uh, you know, so to me, one first thing that I wanted to show is that there is a lot more than that. When I speak of the separation, that you begin to have the formation of these other sphere of activities that begin to disappear, to become invisible, that they are now naturalized as women's work. That's a whole area that Marx does not see. The other part of it, and of course there is a big debate on it now, and, of, and, and I have to say Marx is not clear on that point. So you can actually stretch Marx to say both sides, in my view, uh, is that It, the, 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 <coughs> the question is whether <coughs> for Marx primitive accumulation is a process that occurred at the beginning of capitalism and uh, is specific of that phase uh, and or it is a process that continues to return. So there are many positions on that. My position is that <coughs> in any case whatever Marx may have said There are many statements that can lean one way or the other. But my position is that uh, primitive accumulation is not fixed, is not a, an event that is limited to the origin of capitalism. It's an event that has continuously returned through the history of capitalism. And if you want, you can, you can even say that it's present in every moment of capitalist relation, because every moment of capitalist relation is, uh, uh, pre is premised on the separation of people from the means of their reproduction. But I would say that when you look at the history of capitalism, you see those great moments of return of primitive accumulation, which to me are those moments when that, uh, in which capitalism is in crisis, and in which in order to regain the command over the, 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 the process of accumulation, uh, the, the, the capitalist class has to engage in these massive, massive attacks through war, through expropriation, for instance, colonization. Right? It's, not, it's not an accident that the heyday of imperialism coincides with the peak of, of worker struggles in Europe. Right, the peak of the socialist movement in Europe, for example, in the last part of the 19th century. Or the, I read, for example, World War I or World War II also as those moments in which capitalism needs to disaccumulate the working class. Right? If the essence of a capitalism is the accumulation of labor power, those wars are the disaccumulation, which is the disaccumulation of the combative potential. Uh, you know, what is destroyed on the fields of uh, World War I and World War II is, is the working class that has made the Russian Revolution, uh, which was potential also in, in Europe. It is important to keep this in mind uh, that the primitive accumulation is connected to this important moment in which capitalism is in crisis and needs, in a sense, to regain the command uh, over, over labor. Uh, look, because, uh, you know, in looking at uh, the, the process of globalization today, to understand what, what is globalization, where does it come from, what is attempting to achieve, uh, which I think is, is very much in line uh, 
you know, with uh, the, the, the project of the capitalist class in those moments, like, uh, for example, the launching of colonial conquest, the launching of uh, the imperialist drive, you know, towards Africa and so forth. Um, that's what we're seeing today in globalization, is the idea, the goal of expanding the labor market, uh, expropriating people with in view the expansion of a labor market as a precondition for restoring the discipline of our work. One more question on this transition to capitalism uh, and, and Marx or Marxist position. Um, because M Marx um, and uh, Marxism even more so uh, see actually see capitalism as a precondition of communism, you know, and the development of right. productive forces as a right. precondition. So, so s somehow when you talk about um, you know anti-feudal struggles um, or or even the Commons discussion later on, that's kind of that looks like a kind of critique of that. What, yeah, yeah, yeah. It that? is it is a critique of that because I think that this nice scheme of. Uh, the forces of production and the relations of production, which suggest that somehow you can separate the two. That uh, once you have liberated the forces of production, a certain type of organizational work, including technology, from the particular property relation that are typical of capitalism, then you can really um, have, you know, then, then you have basically the material condition for the communist society. Uh, I, I think that that view, that view I'm completely critical of because first of all you cannot separate the so-called relation of production. Take the, take the division of labor, one of the most productive from the point of view of accumulation and discipline of labor, uh, of organizational work, has been the sexual and international division of labor, the creation of different labor regime. And you cannot separate the development of the productive forces from the type of relations that are actually put into place, developed through the sexual division of labor, which means the development of the productive forces is at the same time the development of division within the working class. So that the idea that you can neatly separate the one and the other, the capitalism can just disgorge this uh, technology and organizational techniques and now we can take them out and put them on a, on a you know, form of um, egalitarian relation, etc., etc. It's a myth, because part of its productivity has been precisely the capacity to organize hierarchy, to organize division within the working class. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, let's turn to the, to the witch hand. Um, could, you, could you give a... Well, maybe let's start like this, you know, because on the book you develop your ideas as a critique of already <coughs> existing studies, or you know, on, on the witch hunt. Could you could you describe this sort of in that way, you know, like yeah. how was it described and what's your critique? Yeah, the, the the witch hunt actually is interesting because more and more the more and more analysis of the witch hunt. By the way, in the recent time, there's been a decline of those studies. Those studies uh, peaked for a while, you know, as a consequence of the women's movement. It was the women's movement that brought back the question of witch hunting. And there was a number of studies that were uh, inspired by it. But now they are declining again. But generally, most of these studies have either stayed away from uh, giving a, trying to find a general motivation for this persecution, and they've only concentrated on analyzing enabling condition, or it, could, it was possible because of this, it was possible because of that, but never trying to, to trace a causal connection. Or if they have tried to trace a causal connection, they have gone to the religious war, the reformation, the basically religious conflict. Uh, there's been all very, very, very little attempt to connect, except actually feminists the on, have been the first who have be really begun to connect uh, the question of the witch hunts to processes of primitive accumulation, to the expulsion of the present. For example, already Star Hawk um, you know, and, and uh, um, Barbara Ehrenreich uh, and uh, Dietrich English, for example, 
hinted the connection between the expulsion of peasantry from the commons and the slave trade and uh, the witch hunt. So, um, but the previous analysis have, uh, by historians have been very, very unsatisfactory in that way. Or um, uh, some have spoken about the transformation, the Christianization of the peasantry that was necessary to, as a cultural means to prepare for capitalism. Um, my analysis is that the witch hunt is obviously a very fundamental process. Uh, I have to say one exception, I have a very important one exception that I found as I was working, doing this research, um, is an Italian historian philosopher, Luciano Parinetto, that I quote, and uh, he was very clear, he is one of, to me, quite exceptional, uh, who states that the witch hunt is a fundamental development uh, in the rise of capitalism, that uh, is one of those uh, developments which are at the gate of the, of the rise of capitalism. Uh, so, and he also saw, unlike others, that the witch hunt was not only a European, but it was also uh, a global phenomenon particularly a phenomenon that uh, in the 16th and 17th century, you know, was brought uh, to, to the American colonies. So, uh, in, in, in my view, when you look at the chronology, the, the, the period in which the witch hunt takes place, uh, when you look at, again, who were the witches, and the means of the persecution, and what kind of crimes they were, uh, accused of, and the effects, the consequences of that persecution, you, you are immediately brought into a world which is not a world of feudal relation. For example, a classical, a classical argument uh, coming from the Enlightenment by uh, historians has been that the, this was the fruit of superstition, of clerical superstition, um, you know, and the dominance of the church, the witch hunting was due to superstition and the dominance of the church in the Middle Ages. Uh, <clears throat> now, the, the, the witch hunts in Europe, when you look at it chronologically, right, uh, begin to take place in a very massive way by the mid, actually the late part of the 16th century. You have a crescendo of witch hunting that starts with uh, the mid-15th century, around 1450, 1460s, you begin to see the first demonologies. Uh, 1480, you have the Malleus Maleficarum, which was one of the main texts uh, by Dominican friars, one of the main texts of, uh, by used then for many, many years by witch hunters. And also you begin to see more trials. But the, the moment in which the witch hunt massify, uh, in particular in places like Germany, Scotland, Switzerland, uh, parts of Italy, uh, England, um, the, the less in Spain. No, not you don't have so many witch hunts in Spain. They are very interesting uh, exceptions that are, are useful to study. France. It's really the period between the 1570s and the 1650. Uh, and uh, witch hunts continue up for another, almost another century, but diminishing, diminishing in importance and in number. Uh, now, when you look at that period, it's a very interesting period. You know, it's a period in which there's nothing left of feudalism. You are in the middle of the development of capitalist relation, and you are in the middle of the most fierce attack uh, on, on, uh, on the population, on the workers' population that uh, you, you can imagine. Because this is the moment when uh, you, in conjunction with the colonization of the Americans, you have the arrival of the bullion, which is beginning, it's like a wind, that destroys relationship, economic relationship throughout a good part of Western Europe, and you know, creating a massive, massive process of popularization, the kind of popularization that we have seen in Africa, 
you know, with structural adjustment, monetary devaluation. You see it in Europe in the very period of the witch hunt. It's a period of massive struggle, right, against enclosure in which women had a very prominent place, massive uprising. Uh, it, it's also, you know, a period, of course, of, of expulsion of people from the land. And it's the period in which all the nuts and bolts in terms of new legislation, new regulation on a local and national level, you know, re regulating, you know, uh, where workers are supposed to live, uh, regulating uh, sexual relationship, regulating prostitution, regulating reproduction, right, where you can begin to see the beginning of a reproductive code being put into place. Uh, as well as the formation of the, the, the workhouse, people being you know, closed into workhouses if they refuse to work, etc., etc. When, when you look at this chronology, you, you have to ask yourself, what is the relationship of the witch hunts? You know? and, and then when you begin to see who were these women, you see that there is a direct correspondence between the women who were being accused of uh, being witches and those rebel subjects that capitalism was trying to destroy. You know, uh, rebel in the sense they were rebelling against the new, the, new, the new rules, but also rebel because they represented a world that uh, the capitalism had to destroy, Re whether they rebelled or not. They represented a whole network of practices and belief and values that in one way or another was being destroyed. And this is what I tried to bring out. And of course, it's the beginning. You know, my, my book, the, the, the hope in which, with which I've written this book, has been the other will pick up their work, because I believe there's a lot more to be discovered and what is, of course, in this book. Uh, but I think that this book gives some general guideline. For example, the relationship between witch hunting and enclosure. The issue of land is very important. Maybe we'll come back to it later. Uh, similarly, the relationship about witch hunting and uh, the reorganization of family life, the reorganization of uh, sexual relationship. You know, the fact that many often the witch is a prostitute or has been a prostitute in her youth or she has had children outside of marriages or she has had a sexual relationship uh, outside of her class. Uh, many women who had relationships uh, with uh, men of the upper classes were accused of being witches. Uh, so. Of course, the question of abortion, infanticide, contraception, all those uh, practices are immediately demonized, are immediately labeled as um, practices that are, that are demonic, that uh, are uh, geared to destroy the life of children, etc., etc. Uh, so, in, this is what, I'm tr this is what um, the chapter on the witch hunt tries to show that in many different ways, as you know, every uh, major uh, initiative by the state against a large group of people, you know, the witch hunt could be used in many different ways. And I often make a parallel with the war on terror today. Right? The war on terror today can be used to attack a broad variety of people. I, for example, unionist activists, we have seen it recently in the United States, how uh, the war on terror can actually uh, be used also to discipline, you know, very peaceful movement, but they represent a certain threat to state uh, and capital policies. You, you already mentioned where it happened, maybe you could, because you do that in the book, like how many were affected or how mm -hmm. were the, you know, women, all women were affected in a certain way, yes. but also how many women were actually accused. Yeah. And then, and then that's one question, but the, the, the more important one is like, how, how were they made witches? Yeah. What, yeah. Who made a, a woman a yeah. witch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, there's been a big dispute about the, the size of the witch hunt. And unfortunately, 
this is a question that we will never be able to resolve uh, because so many archives during the two world wars have, got, have been destroyed. And as a result, particularly in Germany, a lot of archival material has been lost, but not only there. Also, uh, th there's still a, a lot of archival material that has not been analyzed. I mean, there's a, a capillary work that has to be done through churches, small villages, and so forth. And that work is by no means completed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I would say that in my estimate from the, the arguments and documentation that I've seen, we're probably talking about maybe 300,000 women, uh, roughly speaking, uh, in the period of maybe a couple of centuries. Um, there are wild figures that are often quoted, like millions. I don't think that uh, this is possible and there is no evidence for it. But I think that uh, several hundred thousand, it's, it's a more uh, feasible figure. Uh, at the opposite extreme is the idea of six or seven thousand, which has been uh, achieved just by counting some of the main trials that have taken place. Uh, but in many, many cases, the way uh, the, a trial of a witch or a group of women is reported is several women were killed, several women were born, were executed, without numbers being given. Uh, so that, as far as the, the magnitude, um, in terms of how the making of a witch, the making of a witch could be very varied and there's a, there's a lot to be said here about the transformation that uh, the organization of witch hunt uh, goes through, you know, in the course of the two centuries and a half or three centuries when it climaxes. Uh, because, uh, for instance, it's interesting at the beginning uh, the charges are always um, against a, an organization, against the collectivity. And more and more as time goes by, the charges are more against individual people, which in my view reflects the increasing atomization of, of, of relation, individualization of social relations. But a very classical way in which uh, a woman uh, is labeled as a witch uh, is because she generally, she's an older woman, uh, has to depend on her neighbors, the neighbors that are better off uh, for sustenance. Uh, she begs, many, many witches, for, especially in England, were beggars, but not only in England. These were women who, older women, clearly the fact that older women had to beg uh, to, to support themselves, had to go from house to house to house for some wine, for some milk, for some bread, right? Already tells us that a lot has taken place because in the Middle Age, uh, you wouldn't have this situation. In the Middle Age, provision was made for the elderly. Uh, you wouldn't have older women living alone. Uh, usually, there will be a transaction in the servile community, in the peasant community, working at the dependence of a feudal lord. There will be provision made uh, for all the people when the younger generation took over the house and took over the management of the land. Uh, so the fact that these women are alone uh, and begging indicates exactly a society that has gone through a process of enclosure. So they beg, often they are refused, and uh, you know, together with capitalism comes a new ideology that disparages the idea of charity, uh, and uh, they curse, and uh, upon being cursed immediately they are accused of having procured the death of a child, or uh, an illness, or at least the illness of an animal, and so forth. Uh, or they are accused of um, storms. For example, there are storms that uh, destroy the crops of the community, and then particular women are accused of having induced these storms. 
so they, when you look when you look at this um, at this phenomenal at the phenomenology of the witch hunt, there's certain things that really stand out. The first thing that stand out is that the beginning, the, the, the first act of the witch hunt comes from the above. In other words, it comes with legislation. And that this legislation is brought to the village level or to the town level, is brought through the priest at the church. In other words, uh, it's an ideology and it's a fear that is propagated from above. And it's propagated in ways that leave no doubt that if you do not collaborate, you will also be entangled in the, in the network of accusation. Second, when you look at, the, at this phenomenology, you see that there is a landscape in which the witch hunt occurs that has gone through already major, major uh, reorganization, economic reorganization. Because you find that there is already a polarization in terms of the, the distances between people have become much, much wider than ever existed in the feudal communities. Uh, that that you, have, you already have a population of people who are landless or who have no means of subsistence, which again would have been uncommon, very uncommon in, in, the, in the feudal society. So um, the, the making of a witch, it's, it's a making that has many components, and more and more you have a literature, the demonologies, who are now creating the figure of the witch. Right? It's very interesting. They're now telling, okay, these people you have to be aware of. These people do not deserve any type of help. These people are dangerous. These people, and so increasingly they are creating a mass psychosis, or at least a psychosis within certain sectors of the population warning them that those who are the victims of the new transformation in economic relation not only do not have to be helped, but they are potentially dangerous. And this is the environment in which accusation of witch proliferate. Mm. You know, you published the book in 2004. Um, what happened afterwards? Like, was there a discourse in the feminist scene, mm -hmm. or how? how what, what went on? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the, the, I think that the, the book has, has had a certain influence on the feminist scene, uh, um, in terms of, uh, and not only the feminist scene. I think uh, that uh, it has had a very good reception. And I think it had a very good reception because, in a, in, in a way, it filled a certain historical hole that uh, was very prominent, that in terms of understanding the first part, the, the first phase of capitalist development. And uh, in, in that way, it has placed the question of the witch hunt, again, at the center of uh, you know, interest in terms of, of the various social movements. Uh, in, particularly because we have witnessed a return of witch hunting and think that this is the very, very, very important factor that we have to concentrate upon. Uh, in the last three decades, hand in hand with globalization, there's been in many parts of the world, particularly Africa, but also India, also Nepal, uh, a return of uh, witchcraft accusation and uh, of attacks, assault, physical assaults of women. Many have been killed. It's calculated that at least 20 to 30,000 women have been killed just in Africa. 20 to 30,000 women okay. have been killed in Africa. For example, in countries like South Africa, Tanzania, uh, Ghana, um, and, and, and many others. Uh, and uh, Many women have been chased from their villages in the north of Ghana, for example, Zambia, and that is another country that is at Nigeria. Um, in the north of Ghana, there are witches' camps. Uh, there are camps in which women who have been expelled from their communities have been forced to go, and they live there in very miserable condition with some money provided by NGOs and supervision by some local chiefs. Uh, so. This question has uh, you know, generated some interest 
not as much as I would I would have expected. Um, and from a disciplinary point of view, those who have studied this phenomenon have been predominantly anthropologists, and uh, their, their interest has not even been so much on the attacks on women, but their interest has been primarily on the way um, the discourse of the occult has returned uh, in the political discourse in Africa. Uh, so, for example, authors like the Komarov, the two anthropologists who are quite famous, and uh, they have written a number of books that analyze why now you know, politicians in Africa have been using, in a sense, attributing to themselves magical power. But that's a very different thing than, than the question of the specific attack on women, which uh, in a way bring back uh, much more directly the memory of the witch hunts of the 16th, 17th century, because today again it's women who are um, older, who are poor, who are predominantly in the rural areas, and they are again accused of um, causing the death of relatives, causing the death of community members by you know, evil um, practice. And uh, you know, for me, the work I've done uh, on uh, the 16th and 17th century witch hunt has been extremely important because uh, it immediately it has predisposed me to read this new witch hunt in conjunction with the transformation in economic relations that are taking place in Africa and other parts of the world today, which has to do massive attack on means of subsistence, uh, land expropriation, land grabbing, and all the, 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 uh, the effect of this development on the uh, you know, relation between men and women, the fact that women are increasingly excluded from forms of communal property, um, the fact that there is an interest among local chiefs, local authorities, uh, to, to in complicity with foreign companies, to bring an end to communal land structures and expropriate people from there. All of that, clearly, it's in the background of these new witch hunts, mm -hmm. right? I, I would add, I would add an important element. It's also the, the campaign that international institutions are waging against the, the forms of subsistence that women have set into place and have defended, you know, uh, in response to structural adjustment. Now, for example, in response to structural adjustment that has demonetized entire community, a lot of women have taken over land, even in the urban areas, and begun to produce some food, and have begun to create all kinds of subsistence-oriented forms of trade, food production, and so forth, that have enabled the community to support themselves. These now are very much under attack, you know, by the World Bank and all kinds of agencies who are saying that, you know, it's exactly these kind of activities that are the cause of poverty in the world. That actually what women need, community need, is capital, is some money, you know, like the Grameen Bank, microcredit, etc. So, I, I, so I've done, I've written a number of articles on this matter and uh, that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to apply, in a sense, some methodology that I've used to understand the witch hunts of the, of the past uh, to understand those of the present and see that there are effects of globalization. They are not cultural uh, realities, but they are effects of globalization. Um, apart from this, um, you know, very sort of, oh, these accusations, these modern accusations, the witch hunts, um, how would you describe the effect of the witch hunt or this historic defeat, you could say, um, on women today in like sort of you know the, the not 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 just like yeah, particular areas yeah, yeah, but in yeah, general yeah, like yeah. so so I'm yeah it's very interesting that's a very interesting question you know because I've come to the conclusion and here too is another field that I really wish on somebody this is a field if I had five lives this is a field that really because my view is 
the, the witch hunt has never ceased. And uh, I, I, as much as an exaggeration is, it appears to be, but, um, and, and today there is a witch hunt against women taking place that uh, in many forms, you know, first of all, the image of the witch has continued to be there as, um, as uh, a, 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 a disciplinary, as a disciplinary instrument against women. And uh, at the end of uh, Caliban and the Witch, I have uh, some powerful images which shows that the female communards, the so-called petrolos, were really uh, portrayed as witches. Right? So they were never, the, the capitalist imagination has to attack women in, immediately, automatically, it goes back to the image of the witch, you know, this bestial cre creature, all sex and lust, bodily, pure matter, no mind, uh, you know, ready to uh, ally herself to the devil, so evil, irrationally evil, and uh, that image is there. And then, over the years, and, you know, in looking at, for example, old-time Hollywood production from the 40s and 50s and, and 60s, I've realized that the image of the witch has always been in the background. So many movies that, uh, in which, uh, you know, when, when we speak of the witch, it, she doesn't have to be represented, you know, on the top of a broom or on the top of a goat. But uh, this image of the all-evil woman, or for reasons that are undis undiscernible, you know, it's out to destroy men or destroy particular men. And that has continued as a thematic idea, for example, through many of Hollywood production, down into the present, you know, women like the fatal attraction, particularly the attack on the woman now who is all into her career and forgets her maternal duties. There's been a return of figure of witches, you know, connected with that theme. Uh, and it's very interesting, for instance, now to look at the differential way in which Henry Potter, who is the good boy, who does magic, but in very good ways, and uh, Narnia, for example, which is uh, the bad witch, that movies on her are being portrayed and shown to children and she's again the evil, all evil female figure. So I would say in that sense, um, you know, the, the, the witch hunt in that sense has never stopped. Ideologically, the witch is still a very potent image and ideology. Uh, there is a witch hunt also taking place in another way because, for instance, in the United States, uh, there is an attack on women that uh, tries to regain, to restore the control of the state, the control of men, you know, over their body, over their labor, and particularly, you know, uh, intensifies, you know, in times of global crisis when women are expected to take home, back into the home, a lot of unpaid labor. And so, you know, you, you have this, uh, you know, for example, legislation in the U.S that wants to again uh, control or penalize women for any kind of things they do when they are pregnant with, and, and, and looks at women really as a machine for the productions of labor power. So that there are women now who are accused of first degree murder in the US because they used drugs when they were pregnant and in the way they jeopardize. So now you have to be scared that if you drink wine or, or use a drug, uh, you may actually be accused of, you know, attempted murder against the child you're carrying in your belly. And similar legislation is uh, being contemplated in many states. So I would say that particularly with the escalation of the global crisis, you know, witch hunting, war against women, it's actually still with us. Let's look at it from the other perspective because I think this is important because um, when we look at the last decades of course there was a strong women's movement yes. it has actually has had results right. I, I think results that we see still today although they have the backlash mm -hmm. as well but 
And then there's also a positive image of witches That's right. within Absolutely. the feminist movement. So how, how? Well, I think I think that what I describe is precisely a response to the movement. Is precisely because the, it was the women's movement that brought back the interest uh, in the witches and brought back also a revaluation of the figure of the witch. Uh, to what extent uh, the, the historically uh, historically founded or not, but certainly the the witch became a sort of uh, uh, image uh, symbol of the rebel woman that uh, the women's movement took on. And in in Rome, for example, Italian feminists in in the course of a big demonstration, right, they would make a girotondo, how do you call it, merry-go-round singing tremate, tremate, le steghe son tornate, tremble, tremble, the witches are back. And uh, so that identification with the witches uh, was very powerful. And it was the one that inspired many books, beginning with my book. And, which, uh, they, they, and, and with the politicization of the question of witch hunting, you know, uh, and, and uh, because the, 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 the witch hunts have been completely erased, not only erased for history, and depoliticized and ridiculed. I mean, ridiculed in a grotesque way. You know, in the United States on Halloween day, children go out to do trick or treat. So a whole genocide in which uh, hundreds of thousands of women were murdered and horribly tortured and entire communities devastated, you know, is reduced to a little game that children are playing and you have this little girl dressed with, with the hat of the witches that was put on their head before being burned in many cases and they're sporting it with no idea that, that um, you know, horrible, many, many women met their way a horrible death. So it was very important for the, for the women's movement to actually break the silence and to repoliticize that issue and to reopen those books and reopen that history. But the, you know, the, the, I ask about this positive image because I think it's a, it's it's important if we talk here about witches that, especially like you know here they they have a Valpurgis night yes every year right which is considered like sort of a women's demonstration using the image of the witch in a positive sense and, mm -hmm. that, and all the redefinition you mentioned about mm -hmm. sexuality and whatever they try to whether it's justified or not this is actually my mm -hmm. question and I'm like what mm -hmm. do you think about that like, like the sort of the freedom of the women to decide on their own what they want to do mm -hmm. in all aspects of life is sort of seen as a yeah as, as a as a position of as a witch you know the position of the witch is that so what do you th what do you think? Well, you know, I I I distinguish in this sense this a bit of the historical and political, or there are different concepts of political, right? And so, whereas I'm ready to support the use of the image of the witch in that way, at the same time, uh, I would say that uh, the way the the persecution of the witches and witches are understood uh, in some sections of the women's movement is something that, in my research, I cannot support. Mm -hmm. uh, so this idea, for instance, that uh, the witches in Europe were some sort of alternative religion, that there were a sect of women who were going on, um, ancient you know, fertility-oriented uh, rituals, um, which was a theory that in the 20s was uh, launched by you know in a British anthropologist, uh, that's 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 a view that I cannot actually. Uh, the witches were in many cases proletarian women. I call proletarian in the broad sense of terms: poor, low class, rural, or or urban women. Who, who sure they they carry themselves all practices and uh, and uh, you know they they. All, all the, the forms of existence of a pre-capitalist society. For example, um, women throughout the Middle Ages in, uh, in uh, the communities, urban and, and uh, rural communities of Europe, um, did most of their work collectively. 
if you washed, you did it collectively. Uh, you harvested collectively. So there was an intense collective life. And that collective life, of course, was also a source of power. And that is destroyed in the witch hunt, right? But the idea that the, the witches were, you know, a specific group with a specific culture, these have not been able, and this culture had, uh, these women had a sort of feminist consciousness. These I have not been able mm -hmm. to find any it foundation is, for. It also seems that this is somehow linked to this idea of like female, a specific female spirituality as, as like sort of yeah. the motherhood idea, right? Which is yeah. also... Yeah, like that also, yeah. exactly. No, that... that uh, because the, the women accused of being witches were a wide variety of women. There were peasant women who were in, in struggle around land, right? There were women who were practicing, who were actually practicing healing. Huh? And they were going from house to house, marking, etc., etc. It was not necessarily they had a particular form of spirituality. You know, one of my aunts in, in rural Italy, um, not, not aunts, uh, but, but the female ancestor, that my mother told me about, you know, made her living even in the 19th century, but was marking animals, right? In other words, you made certain signs and pronounced certain words, and probably uh, three centuries ago she would have been burnt as a witch, right? But so a healing of animals and humans uh, was uh, a profession for many women and certainly a source of power, or predicting the future. Other women were women who were accused uh, because of their sexuality, mm? because they had illegal relation, because they had children out of, of uh, marriage, etc. So there's a wide variety of female figures who have, and to speak of the witch uh, persecution being the attack on particular forms of spirituality, uh, is something that so far I don't think has an historical verification. Mm -hmm. Last question from my side. Um, you know the book will be published in German this, this fall. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering whether you have any proposals like how to pick up on this debate, you know, like how, how to connect them. You, you, you gave a few hints already in your talk, right? Um, to connect like this book and, and the mm -hmm. subjects of the book with sort of ongoing discussions mm -hmm. today. Do you have any proposals? Yeah. Well, you know, I think I basically my proposal would be, my proposal would be, I, I think I would like the book, wherever it is published, to be a new beginning uh, in terms of research and analysis of the witch hunt. You know, I hope that the book is a beginning, that somebody takes this book, reads it, and starts off doing new work and there's going to be another Caliban in the witch 10 years from now or whatever. Uh, because they think that there's a lot, a lot of issues that should be explored. You know, I myself would like to, I don't want to, there are so many things, so much work to do now that I'm continuously combated between the desire to continue their work, which I try as best as I can, particularly with a, a relation to the present, and also to move on to what is happening today, and particularly the new struggles. Um, but for instance, I've been very interested in developing the theme of enclosure. You know, witch hunt and enclosure, in what specific ways, you know, the witch hunt, for instance, relates to the question of enclosure, land enclosure, forest enclosure. Now, that's one part of it, but it's an important part of it, and it certainly relates also directly to what is happening now, when you have new witch hunt in the context of massive, massive land grabbing. And it's now recognized, even the, the every journalist now recognizes, that both in Africa and in India, which are the, the main places for this new witch hunting, the connection with land is primary. It's one of the key connections with land. Of course, it's never exclusive of gender relation, uh, gender hierarchy, because why women? So obviously the issue of hierarchies, the issue of a certain conception of femininity, it's there, right? But there is the, the, the context, for instance, uh, the enclosure, land grabbing provides an important context. So 
our personal hope that somebody picks up in this direction. Now, I, I've done some work, for example, trying to show that when you look at the accusation, particularly in the first period of the witch hunt in Europe, right, the accusation relating to animals, right, the, the charges that uh, the, the witches are hurting animals or they are hurting the, stay, the crops through their storms, you can almost recompose it's like a puzzle that you can put all the pieces together and you see a, 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 a population which on one side are the expropriated, the land expropriated, and the other you have the expropriators. Uh, so this kind of analysis is what I would hope that uh, would, would, uh, would be taken on as a result of this new publication. And of course, in each, time, in each case, to see the connection with the present, because to me the witch hunt is still with us. One thing I've learned about doing history is that these big events, and particularly these big injustices, right, these big crimes the capitalism has, co has uh, committed, uh, are, are, not, are not in the past, they cannot be archived. They have to be kept there with us always and always and always, because in a way they, they, they structure the horizon of, and, and they structure a certain understanding of what is capitalist society, what are capitalist relations. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, well, thanks.